Greetings and welcome back to room 303 in AP English. And we turn in our study of uh, Virgil's Aeneid now to book seven, uh, Beachhead in uh, Levatium and uh, Armies Gather. Now, really, this is uh, one of those. I mean, I've, I've been challenged by a few of you. Uh, Mr. McGee, in your last lecture, you talked about how this text is a propedeutic. Can we just call it what it is, propaganda? And I think that I, 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 hear, I hear what you're saying, and I think you're absolutely right. There's no question. When we hit book seven, we are definitely playing a game here that we have seen many, many times before. One of the key stories that empires will always tell about themselves is the glory of conquest. And it usually is supported, often even demanded by uh, the gods. Uh, now, there's a few comments I'll make right before I even get into this conversation. Um, the, the, the key teaching, okay, we'll call it propaganda of book seven is, the land that you must conquer, uh, you're going to have to conquer its peoples through war and uh, often an alliance of marriage, which means what? Well, a lot of innocent people are going to get jacked along the way. It's the way, it's the way that empires define the expediency of the fact that they are great empires. However, let's point out some similarities very quickly between Book 7 and Book 1. Some have called Book 7 a reboot of the Aeneid. And it is ironic that today's audience, like several of you guys have already been saying to me, I don't really like the way Book 7 and, and, and beyond read. I like much more those stories of Aeneas and Dido and the underworld journey and all of that. It was the complete opposite, apparently, for the Romans. They loved what was going on in the second part of the Aeneid, the Iliadic part of the Aeneid, some have called it. Um, some have seen the first six books as the Odyssey of Virgil and the second six books as the Aeneid, uh, as the Iliad of Aeneid. I think that's too simple. I think that we can see evidences of both. For example, notice some similarities in book one uh, and book seven. In book one and in book seven both, Aeneas is going to land on a foreign land, going to meet a ruler, going to be greeted. Things are going to go well until they don't go well, go sideways. And most importantly, Juno is going to play a pivotal role in causing all kinds of problems, both in book one as now as, as, as in book seven. Um, uh, let's, let's just comment now very briefly where we've been. If you haven't been following our lectures, again, learnstrong.net. The assumption is that you're in the AP folder. You've already watched my lectures on the Iliad and the Odyssey, as well as the first six books of the Aeneid. Let's review quickly. In book one, of course, uh, Aeneas is going to end up in Carthage. In book two, he's going to tell Dido about the fall of Troy. And in book three, the finishing of that story. And in book four, the tragic story of the fall of, of uh, Dido in her love uh, of Aeneas. In book five, off to Sicily they go for funeral games. And then in book six that we just finished, Aeneas' journey to the underworld with Sybil, where he is told by his father that majorly important things are coming. In other words, what you're doing here, son, is important to the history of the world, and of course, especially to Rome. I've tried to explain to my American students what this would be like. Uh, America, obviously, the superpower of the world. And so if somebody were to sit down, a Virgil today, were to sit down and write this kind of poem, the assumption is already that America is the great empire. So the explanation is to why. And so the first six books kind of gets us ready for the major stories that are about to happen. But if we were writing it today, for example, well, we could include all of the history of the First World War and the Second World War and the important events and the involvement of America as it became the great superpower that it became. And all of those stories would be referenced, but readers today of that poem would understand, well, yeah, that stuff is old history. But in many ways, book six will tell it as if it's coming in the future, right? Now, again, the hope is that you read this stuff on your own and use me. Again, our learning theory is the capacity to connect new information to old information in meaningful ways. And again, we'll do that through our reading annotative work at, two, at level one, summary at level two A, themes, messages at two B. We're going to continue to concentrate on symbolism and irony. And then at level three, how can I own this information, somehow relate to it at three A? Again, we'll go back to our work with the Iliad and the Odyssey. For example, in the Iliad book two, we have that famous catalog of the ships. We're going to have a very similar 
kind of thing happening at the conclusion of, of, of any of seven here. And then finally, we'll ask you at 3B, how can I relate to this information in some kind of meaningful way? And there's no question, I'm going to ask you some pretty demanding, challenging kinds of questions, especially about this stuff that we're reading. All right, let's do a real quick, brief summary of book seven and see, uh, and see kind of what we have to say here. Aeneas arrives at the Tiber, which will of course be the future Rome. We have the king, uh, uh, Latinus, who will, who will be there, Latinius, who will be there. He has a, he has a daughter named Lavinia. Um, he wants to marry her off to, to Turnus, who he thinks he's going to marry her off to, but he makes the decision after some omens that no, he has to marry her off to a foreigner. Uh, the queen, Amata, has, it, ha, is having none of that. She is like, no, we've already betrothed our daughter to Turnus, and so put it in your notes right away. We're going to have domestic disharmony that will ultimately then lead to the nasty war that will be the rest of the Aeneid. The uh, Trojans, we're told, will make what appears almost to be pizza, and they will eat their platters. That is to say, they will eat the bread on which they have put their their uh, their their uh, food. And uh, immediately, Aeneas recognizes that this is the place. The next day, the Trojans will give their explanation. Exploration. Uh, Latinus will, in fact, accept these gifts and offer his daughter Lavinia to Aeneas. And so we'll have the beginning of the conflict. The conflict's original uh, origination is in many ways those Juno. She will get Alecto, the Fury, who has these nasty s snakes for her hair, and she will begin to jack slowly one after another. First Amata, the queen, she will put a snake in her breast, that is to say the woman goes absolutely nuts behaving like the Bacchae's um, women uh, going crazy. And she gets all the other women involved as well. Then Alecto will go to Turnus and in a dream will speak to him and tell him to fight. First he's irreverent to her and then she shows her true form and he is uh, convinced it's time to go to war. Then, interestingly, Alecto will go to the Trojans, to Elias, to Ascanius, and will convince him that he needs to kill a deer, a stag. And he does so. He shoots the stag but the stag is the favorite stag of one Sylvia, and she is very upset, which will lead all of the Italians and the herbsmen then to begin to get ready to go to war. Notice this will be an important message at the end of our lecture, that from a silly, trivial thing oftentimes, major conflicts will arise. We, of course, in our own history of the world as we study it, are easy, easily able to point out the ways that happens. We have our first major fight where two important people die, a very young man named Albo and a very old person, um, Galatius, and both of them uh, are of, of Latin, they're Latins, they're Italians, and they both will die, which is only going to foreshadow all of the death that's about to happen in this poem. Latinus will then uh, speak to his people and he will tell them all that they are fools. He will go to his room and lock himself in his room. He wants none of what's about to happen. Juno will open the famous twin gates of war to prove to everyone that now is the time. And then it's a celebration of the slaughter that's about to happen. The list of Turnus's allies will finish just like the Iliad 2 catalog of ships. The point here is two things right away. It's going to be a rough, rough war for Aeneas to get what he wants, namely, of course, the founding of Rome. And second, we're going to get this propagandizing of the celebration of war and the idea that going to war is such an amazing thing. When we pick up and we read remarks uh, to, uh, all quiet on the Western Front, which is really the greatest novel about what war really is like. We have a bunch of German lads who have been educated in, in their schools, and they've been educated, we're told, over and over again with the songs of war. And, of course, the Aeneid is exactly, and more particularly, Book 7, and the books to follow is exactly what we're talking about. Now, again, I wish I could read all of this out loud with you. I just don't have the time. So we'll only hit certain lines as we go through this. It's interesting, though, how this second part of the Aeneid, this war song, and that's really what it is, begins. It begins with the death of Aeneas's nurse, Caeta. And Caeta, we're told, you too have granted our shores a fame that never dies, and now your honor preserves your resting place, and is such glory as any glory at all, your name marks out our, bo uh, uh, our, your, name marks out your bones in the great land in the west. 
Interestingly, this will be a book of women, and especially the women who will contribute to the glory of war, starting and ending, in fact, with a woman. Uh, a camellia will be the, the last woman mentioned, in fact, in this. So the, it, it's a beautifully crafted, I mean, can I say this out loud? I don't mean to insult. But yeah, it is a poem of propaganda, but it's a beautiful poem of propaganda, and we have to, exp we, I, think, I think on both counts, we have to respect what it is that Virgil pulls off, and obviously we, yes, of course, we have to be critical of the fact, the notion that we are telling young Roman soldiers how beautiful it is to go off into battle and get slaughtered or to slaughter, right? We're told that Aeneas and his men, they sail, they go past Circe's Island. Notice this one. Um, Ulysses gets stuck on Circe's Island for a year and is distracted. Aeneas gets struck with Dido in Carthage and is distracted, but he doesn't go to Circe. And off they go. The first side of the Tiber is at line uh, 33 or so. Lots of birds there. He says, change course, and he, and he sails into land. And he says it. Um, Virgil now says it at line uh, uh, 39, 40, 41. Now come. We're going to get the invocation of the muse again. Now come, Arato. Who were the kings, the tides, and times? How stood the old Latin state when that army of intruders first beached their fleet on Italian shores? All that I will unfold, I will recall how the battle first began. And you, goddess, inspire your singer. Come, I will tell of horrendous wars, tell of battle lines and princes fired with courage, driven to their deaths, Etruscan battalions, all Hesperia called to arms. A greater tide of events springs up before me now. I launch a greater Labor. Now, this notion of launching a greater labor, ha, labor has led a lot of scholars to point out that Virgil believes and the Roman readers believe that what's coming in books 7 through 12 far more important than what preceded. Again, postmodern audiences have a, have a much different often view of this. I'm going to hope that you can have what I would call, and in 303 we're always challenging to have, a balanced view. That is to say, let's read it. Let's appreciate it. Let's not close our mind off just simply because we call it propaganda. I mean, on that count, all of the video games that celebrate war are often a form, are also a form of propaganda, although many of my students don't want to see it that way. Let's be, let's be more sophisticated, and let's look at the actual rest of this book. After the invocation of the muse and that greater labor, we meet King Latinus right away. And after we're told King Latinus has one um, daughter, and, uh, Lavinia, and he's already betrothed this to Turinus, who at line 61 is mentioned for the first time, strong in his noble birth and breeding, and we're also going to be told, although not named, that the queen, the mother, Amata, wants Lavinia to marry Turnus. Then we're told the king starts to witness signs. We have bees bending down laurel trees. We have um, uh, the message that strangers are coming. We have a Lavinia whose hair catches on fire. Maybe not literally, but symbolically. We can think about, for example, Elias in uh, Book 2 uh, and that tongue of fire on, on his head. Um, that is to say, all of these signs are telling us something at line, 80, at line 86. That sight was brooded about as a sign of wonder terror. For Lavinia, prophets sang of a brilliant fame to come. For the people, they foretold a long grueling war. And then we're told that King Latinus in his shrine begins to really have his doubts. He slaughters a hundred sheep and he gets this, uh, this message back at line 105. Never seek to marry your daughter to a Latin. Put no trust, my son, in a marriage ready made. Strangers will come and come to be your sons and their lifeblood will lift our name to the stars. Their sun sons will see wherever the wheeling sun looks down on the ocean rising or setting east or west. The whole earth turn beneath their feet their rule. In other words, before America was a superpower, there was another superpower, and it was, of course, Rome, the first great superpower, if you will. And here it is. The, the, you're going to rule the world someday. Don't marry your daughter off to Turnus. Marry your daughter off to some stranger, of course. It will, it will be Aeneas, right? Rumor will spread. Then we have at line 120 that Aeneas and his men sit down spreading a feast on wheat and cakes, Jove himself impelled them, heaping the plates with Circe's gifts or country fruits. And once they devoured all in sight, still not sated, their hunger drove them on to attack the faithful plates themselves, the crust we would probably call today, their hands and teeth defiling, ripping into the thin, dry crusts, never sparing a crumb of the flatbread scored in quarters. Suddenly, Ulius shouts, What? We're even eating our platters now? 
only a joke we're told at line 127 and nothing more but his words once heard first spelled an end of troubles as they first fell from the boy's lips and of course Aeneas immediately seizes on it and he says at line 133 hail to the country owed to me by fate again we're back to that notion that the reason why a conqueror can come into a land and conquer it is fate or the, or the gods, the will the gods has decreed it. Hail to you, he says, my faithful household gods of Troy. Here is our home, here is our native land. For my own father, I now remember, Anchises left me these secret signs of fate. Of course, it really wasn't Anchises, you'll remember. Um, uh, back to book 3, uh, 29, it was actually the harpy, right, um, Salato, who, who gave that information to him about eating of the plates. There is the last trial, he says, which is to explore the land, and he's ready to go. He prays to the gods, as a pious man always does, and he is, of course, pious. He prays to his parents at line 160. Jove will clap thunder three times, and then immediately Aeneas is ready to start building the trench for his new city. The next day, the uh, warriors are sent out to explore, and at line 170 or so, Aeneas orders a hundred envoys picked from all ranks to approach the king's imperial city, bearing an olive branch of palace wound in wool, bearing gifts for the great man, and sue for peace for all the Trojan people. They waste no time moving out on command, setting a brisk pace. So you've got this project where Aeneas doesn't, in fact, Aeneas is ironically not going to be very present in this book at all. It's the one book that we just don't see him very much. He will send his envoys out, and they will show up at Latinus's court, and of course will make their offer. You get the understanding, though, they're going to make the offer. If Latinus rejects it, they're going to go to war against him. He, uh, Aeneas then, and, uh, for the rest of the book, is basically planning the walls of Rome at line 180. The young um, Latins are, in fact, outside the city practicing for war as... The uh, Trojans show up at 185. There before the city, boys and young men in their vibrant pride of strength are training as riders, breaking teams in the whirling dust, bending their tough light bows, hurling home javelins, full shoulder throws, challenging friends to race or box. When a herald comes riding up toward the Trojans, bringing news to the old king's ear, powerful men in strangers' dress, they're on their way here now. King Latinus has them summoned into the palace and takes his father's throne amidst, the, amidst them all. And then in they come. The palace is amazing. Um, we get descriptions of the weapons at line 210. Let's just put it in our notes. Um, the Aeneid is very interested in weapons. So just put that in your notes. And the whole notion that weapons define the warrior and all of that. We're going to see more of that. The first word's coming at 223. And he will say, Tell us, sons of Dardanus, for we know your city, your stock. We heard, of you, you, we heard you, that you were sailing here. What do you search for now? What cause, what craving has sailed your ships to Italy, crossing many seas? Whether your lost or storms have swept you far off course, dangers that soldiers often suffer. In other words, and then he reminds them that we are Saturn, whether the Latins are Saturn's people, fair and just, not because we're bound by curbs or laws, but kept in check of our own accord, the way of our ancient God. In other words, we hail from the darkness as well. Um, and then um, Aeolius, uh, the, the speaker now for Aeneas, will speak at 245, and he will say, um, No black gales, no stormy seas uh, brought us here. With a firm resolve and willing hearts, we've reached your city, driven out of our own kingdom, once the greatest realm the wheeling sun could see from Olympus' heights, because obviously Troy was destroyed by the Greeks. Our race takes root from Jove, the sons of Dardanus, triumph in Father Jove, of the Father's highest stock, our king himself, Aeneas of Troy, who sent us to your gates. How savage the storm that broke from brute Mycenae, scour um, scourging Ida's plains. In other words, it was brutal the way that we lost our city. How fate compelled the worlds of Europe and Asia to clash in war, the great Trojan War. All people know the story, all at the earth's edge, cut off where the rolling ocean bounds them back, and all whom the ruthless sun in the torrid zone, arching amidst the four cool zones on earth, sunders far from us. Everybody knows about the fall of Troy, in other words. Escaping that flood and sailing here over many barren seas now, all we ask is a modest resting place for our father's gods, safe haven on your shores, water, fresh air that's free for all to breathe. 
We will never shame your kingdom, nor will your fame be treated lightly. No, our thanks for your kind work will never die, nor will Italy once regret embracing Troy in her heart. The irony is running deep here, because in just a few moments, a few hours we might even say, we're going to have already the first battle. He says, I swear by Aeneas' fate by his right hand, prove staunch in loyalty, strong in feats of arms, that many nations, many, and don't slight us now, because we come with an olive branch held out in desperate pleas, that many people have urged us strongly to join them as allies. We think of Carthage, that Dido invited them to stay. But the gods will spurn us on to seek your land. Their power forced us here. In other words, you always blame it on the gods, right? Here Dardanus was born. Here the clear commands of Apollo call him back as the god impels us toward the Tuscan Tiber, the Nemesis scapegoat springs. Aeneas, moreover, offers you these gifts, remains of his former riches, meager relics plucked from the fires of burning Troy. And then, uh, you know, we're told that this goblet, gold goblet, Father Anchises tipped with wine at the high altars. This was Priam's regalia, when in the like he liked to rule, handed down the laws to his gathered people. Notice how laws keeps coming back again and again. The scepter, the holy carnet, and the robes that Trojan women used to weave. We're familiar with all those, all those robes that are mentioned in the Iliad and, of course, the Odyssey. It's at that moment we're told that Latinus, who's been listening but looking down at the ground, he knows, he is aware something's up, and he says as much. He says so. This, he thinks, is the man foretold by fate, that son-in-law from a foreign home, and he's called to share my throne with equal power. His heirs will blaze in courage, their might will sway the world. And at last, he speaks out now out loud, that was kind of thoughts to himself, filled with joy. May the gods speed the plans that we launch here. There's dark irony here, because anything but that's going to happen when the god Juno gets involved. Their own omens too. Your wish will be my command. Trojan, I embrace your gifts. While Latinus rules, you'll never lack rich plowland. Bounty greatest Troys. Just let Aeneas, if he needs us so, and presses so to join in alliance and take the name of comrade, come in person and never shy from the eyes of friends. And then he says it. I have a daughter, and I welcome him as Aeneas as ours. In other words, I'm going to give I'm going to give him uh, my daughter. He gives 300 horses as a gift. A chariot he's given to Aeneas with an immortal horses involved. We think of Achilles and his famous immortal horses as well. And then at line 331, it all goes sideways. But look, the merciless wife of Jove, right, uh, Juno, was winging back from Argos, holding course through the heavens when from afar she spies Aeneas, exalting Trojan ships at anchor, men building their homes already, trusting the land already, their fleet abandoned now. Juno stopped, transfixed with anguish, then shaking her head, this exclamation came pouring from her heart. One of these soliloquies, again, that we are so familiar with, where the gods get to speak out loud. That cursed race I loathe, she says, so couldn't they die on the plains of Troy? So couldn't they stay defeated in defeat? Couldn't the fires of Troy cremate the Trojans? No! Through the shocks of war, through walls of fire, they found a way. Now, obviously, Romans are going to read this and say, yes, hurrah, right? What am I to believe? My power's broken down at last, glutted with hatred. Now I rest in peace. Oh, no. When they were flung loose from their native land, I dared to haunt those exiles through the breakers, battled them down the ocean.